Cool. Sweet. All right. Thanks, guys, for waiting. So why are we all here today? Um, so we're here for an introduction to Ethereum. But uh, once again, if you are interested in decontrol, Dogecoin, celebrating Dogecoin and all of this crypto coolness and culture, uh, there is a mailing list at the back that you can sign up for. And obviously, if you made it here tonight because of the Decontrol meetup group, then that's a great way to find out about all the events that happen here. There's a Slack that uh, Decontrol runs. It's very, very, very active. There's a lot of people um, that sort of have come through Vancouver, but also that um, that like are kind of resident in Vancouver. They're building stuff. They're, you know, they're trading, they're investing in things, um, or they just generally like like the culture, they like kind of, you know, what happens down at Decontrol, which is basically just, you know, sharing all these ideas around decentralization. But tonight, uh, I'm gonna give a talk um, called Intro to Ethereum, and basically we're gonna talk about smart contracts, token economies, and decentralization. Um, my background is as a software developer, and I got into the space, uh, at the beginning of 2017, some guys said, hey, let's start a venture studio and let's invest in a bunch of blockchain companies and you know, you can learn about Ethereum and Solidity and blockchain programming and decentralized applications and you can kind of be like our tech guy. That never happened. And then another company said, hey, I wanna do this venture studio and we're gonna invest in eight to 10 different blockchain companies and that never happened. So now I don't have a job, but I'm doing okay, so don't worry. Um, but yeah, I, I've been doing this talk, uh, it started with a couple of friends from Decontrol since uh, about like June or July 2017. I think they did a June talk and then I joined in the July talk to offer a bit more of like a developer's perspective on things. And um, then, you know, they, you know, they're doing really well. They got hired, they're down in San Francisco and, you know, they're flying around Japan and doing all sorts of cool stuff. So it's... Um, it's a cool space. There's uh, there's lots of work, and uh, basically, you know, it's it's fine to talk about you know the the investment side, the financial side of cryptocurrency and crypto assets, and that's definitely a part of it for a lot of people. But when you actually start to think about um, building blockchain applications and building kind of uh, tool sets for individuals to kind of to live in this you know this new kind of world or niche economy. Uh, that is decentralized, where people really truly own their assets and have sovereignty over their, you know, their their exchange of value. It starts to become a lot more interesting when you start to think about the applications you can build. So that's um, a bit more what this talk is about, because Ethereum is a a general purpose uh, blockchain platform based on programmable smart contracts. So I'm just going to kind of go through the talk. If you have questions, if you wouldn't mind, just let's hang on to them, and then we'll come back around and we'll let it kind of evolve into what kind of what points of interest you guys want to talk about. But I'll just kind of speed through this, and you know, if you if it's too much um, and you guys are getting hit with uh, with a lot, just take a note. We can always come back to the slides. So basically, um, Ethereum is blockchain technology, a lot like Bitcoin. So it's a basically a protocol that you run on a computer to participate in the network. Um, but unlike Bitcoin, it has what's called like a virtual machine. So basically it can actually run and execute code. And it does this on the decentralized network so that the execution of the code is uh, fair, transparent, trustless, however you want to refer to it. It's basically it's computation you can trust without trusting a central entity. Um, so again, based on consensus, a lot like Bitcoin, it's proof of work today, like Bitcoin, this sort of like little toasters kind of humming away, trying to crack a cryptography puzzle in order to, to be the next you know, chosen validator of a block. Um, but it's moving to proof of stake tomorrow, and that, um, not literally tomorrow, but soon. Um, <laughs> but it's, uh, proof of stake is, is different. It's a bit of a twist on uh, consensus. So consensus is how the network achieves an agreement on what the next sort of the next set of transactions that get accepted should be, which is like saying it's how the network achieves uh, agreement on the update to the database that everyone shares. So it's like a shared the database is like shared 
single source of truth. Um, so why does all this matter? Well, it removes intermediaries and trusted third parties in computation. Um, so right now, if we wanted to kind of get some computation done in the cloud, you, you know, boot up a machine on DigitalOcean or Amazon, right? And we, you know, we'd run some code on it. But how does anyone else know what's on our box and what code we're running and if we're lying about the answers, right? It's very opaque. And uh, even we don't know, you know, Amazon may just say, hey, we're just a messenger, but we don't know if they're kind of, you know, behind the scenes manipulating the dials. So we want to live in a, in a world where we don't have those concerns. We don't have those trust issues. So individual sovereignty uh, protected from censorship. I'll kind of come back to that in a bit, in a, a few more, a few slides later on. And really what it comes down to is it comes down to peer-to-peer -to -peer decentralized value and economies. So basically, like I gave those examples of uh, from Dogecoin and sort of the celebration of, of stuff like CryptoKitties and, and pop art that people just find interesting and valuable in their own way, but because a group finds it valuable, that's why it becomes valuable, if that makes sense. Um, and then we can now build those systems, micro economies, little, like we could just build an economy out of this room here that was truly peer to peer. And if we all believed that chair tokens were valuable because, you know, we want to sit down, then we would ascribe some value to them. And then we'd say, no, that's my chair. I get to sit there, right? And then we kind of start creating rules around this. And that's what a general purpose blockchain like Ethereum lets you do. It lets you sketch, write code to quickly create these kind of systems. So the history of Ethereum, um, it's not a one man show. So uh, we always have this kind of this fallacy of the, the one hit wonder or the, the artist, or not the one hit wonder, but the, uh, you know, the artist that just was an overnight success. Um, so basically, um, it started as a white paper that was proposed by Vitalik Buterin, but it came from a lot of pre-work. So uh, Vitalik was working at a bunch of different um, places. He was you know, an editor to this Bitcoin magazine, and he saw a lot of different altcoins. So these are basically cryptocurrencies that were not Bitcoin, but they were altcoins popping up to represent different things, to say, you know, we're kind of like Bitcoin, but we also do this. We're kind of like Bitcoin, but we also do that. And he thought, well, why not just make this general purpose blockchain that you can kind of program all of these ideas on top of, and then just have one main blockchain, and then you can represent all these different ideas using this, you know, programmable smart contract. So there's a large legal, capital, and technical team behind it. There's all these like whole host of kind of names that you you probably might know from the space if you've been kind of looking into it. Um, Joseph Levins runs Consensus, Vinay Gupta runs Materium, Gavin Wood runs Parity, and it just goes on and on and on. Uh, Anthony DiOrio wrote, uh, had the big party in New York that everyone made fun of. Um, he's special. Um, so they did an ICO from July to August 2014, um, and they raised about 23 million Bitcoin, I think, uh, roughly that uh, at the time. And basically that equated to 11.9 of these Ethereum being pre-mined and distributed, 11.9 million. Um, so it's currently worth, I don't know, and uh, the current supply is, I don't know, because the blockchain keeps going and they keep validating new blocks and paying out rewards. Um, so, the current developer ecosystem though, it's pegged at about 30 to 50 X other blockchains. And what I mean by that is not developers that are just developing the core Ethereum protocol, but actually all of these other smart contract protocols and ecosystems and economies and things like CryptoKitties on top of that. So if you count all of these projects, you go to GitHub, you look at the, the people who are contributing to these repositories that are built on top of Ethereum, you get to quite a quite an astounding number of people that are, you know, that are downloading the dev tools to build on Ethereum that are actually contributing to repositories. It's it's pretty wild right now. So why does all it matter? Why, why does all it matter? Um, why does it matter? Why it matters? Um, so one word, it's trust, right? So, like I gave a kind of a bit of a foreshadowing in some of these examples, um, you know. 
wouldn't it be nice to live in a world where we didn't have to trust that things were being done um, <coughs> fairly, where we just knew? So trust was kind of removed as part of the equation. So uh, I think it's it's safe to say, without being um, you know rubbed out by some government guys, um, that banks, corporations, and government, the trust is at an all-time low, um, and it's for good reason. Like we've had a lot of we've had a lot of upset in the last years for certain people that were in, you know, maybe equities in 2008 and kind of like lost a lot of money. Um, and you know, the cost of living's going up, prices are rising, and uh, you know, taxes is getting, even becoming a little bit weird, like the CRA keeps announcing, we're gonna crack down on this, we're gonna crack down on that. And you're scratching your head wondering, why do you need so much tax, right? Um, I mean, it's just, life's becoming expensive. Uh, and you know, we, the people, we kind of need a sovereign check on just this, this power that's kind of creeping in, right? So maybe we want to create you know, small little kind of micro economies amongst ourselves in our local communities. We want to exchange things that are valuable, but we don't really want to pay a tax on every dollar that we move around, right? Um, there's also data to concern yourself with. It's not just all about money at the end of the day. I don't want to talk about the Facebook thing, but you guys all know what happened. Um, there's privacy, so surveillance and, and all of that kind of stuff. And just a way to organize, to coordinate, to govern ourselves, right? There may be more fair and open and transparent systems that we can build. But we don't have to bring it all down and then we don't have to like pop on tinfoil hats and say we gotta decentralize it, man. But you know, maybe it's maybe it's just a concept of uh, of thinning things. You know, like we kind of thin out what's what's inefficient from the old system, and we kind of build new support systems that are efficient. That's kind of my my belief for both like the corporate kind of private world and the public world as well. Is that you just thin it, you know, and then decentralize parts of it. Um, so digital transformation trade offs when we all move to digital stuff like. We used to have a lot more cash in circulation. I mean, people used to trade, like, you know, people used to barter, right? Like, only a couple hundred years ago, and silver coins, and yada, yada, yada. But when we moved to digital, in like, arguably, a lot of it moved to digital in the 80s, and credit came in, and things like that, it was, you know, control over our own finances, and our, our kind of, you know, our, <coughs> our own self, um, for simplicity, and that's the same thing with the move to cloud. Like, you know, on-site deployment for a Fortune 500 company is expensive. You got to hire a bunch of like IT dinosaurs that are running a bunch of servers in the basement, and then you move to cloud, and everything's all simple, right? So infinitely scalable, blah blah blah. Um, but it's really control for simplicity, and then you have security for safety nets. So there is no bank of Bitcoin. Um, there's no bank of Ethereum either. And if you lose your private key, you're toast, right? If you send it to the wrong address, too bad. It never happened. That person never got paid. You have no recourse, right? So there's sort of like, you know, the security of owning your own assets comes with a caveat, right? Great power, great responsibility. So we traded security for safety nets when we let the banks, you know, digitally transform our cash into a bunch of numbers in our bank account. And they can just do whatever they want. And they have fun doing that. And then there's sovereign, sovereignty for complacency. So basically, to take control of your life and to you know, choose how your data and your privacy and your finances are moved around and manipulated and kind of, you know, stuff's being done to you that you don't really know because it's kind of just, you know, you're just exhausted and you just want to look at like a feed of news. Um, you know, you trade sovereignty for complacency. So having an active choice over kind of, you know, what you're able to do versus just kind of sitting back and just taking whatever they're going to spoon feed you. So anyway, those are just my thoughts on the space. Um, capitalism 1.0, it's dying. Um, open, fair, transparent systems are emerging. So if you want to kind of compete in this new economy, which is very, very niche right now. I'm not naive, guys. It's very niche right now, but it may become quite a, you know, swirling big part of the economy. And at least that's what I hope for, where people have to compete on actual value-added services in a open, fair, and transparent system.
So when you want to think about like what's being launched already today, you look at what's called decentralized applications and protocols. So this is on top of Ethereum, the core blockchain. I, I won't get into like any blockchain versus blockchain politics. We can talk about it in the Q and A if you want. But basically, what's being built on Ethereum? Well, it's, it's protocols, which is to say that they're like a suite of smart contracts that kind of you know they interop and they offer different services. So you can take a coin and you can stake it to, you know, to basically say that you're a good actor as part of some protocol and you're gonna, you know, fill orders and make trades and do a bunch of cool stuff. Um, and actually this graphic, the top one, is only taken from the website of what's called the Zero X protocol. So it's simply a protocol to trade these tokens, ERC20 tokens, with each other. And you may have heard of ERC20 tokens or or um, if you haven't, they're basically just they're basically just other coins and tokens built on Ethereum. So this was just taken from their website. So these are all of the projects. Some of them are also other protocols, other smart contract protocols that interoperate with the Zero X protocol, and they're built on top. And then this is taken from um, OpenSea, which is a um, is it taken from OpenSea? No, it's taken from State of the DApps. Um, so this is a website that tracks all the decentralized applications being built on Ethereum. So you see you've got CryptoKitties, you got something called Crypto Figures, Enter the Blah Blah, Decentralized News Network. Um, I don't even recognize a lot of them because guys, there's like 1,500 projects on this website now. And these ones, you know, beta, live, live, work in progress, right? So <clears throat> when I say that there's a nascent, like, little economy that's, like, you know, booting up right now, it's really just, it, it is kind of just emerging, which is exciting. So now I'm going to switch gears to so we'll talk about a little bit about the dev, so talk about how Ethereum works. So I've mentioned it a se several times. Um, smart contracts, what are they? Um, well, basically they're code that is written in typically a language called Solidity. I am aware that there's other smart contract programming languages. Solidity seems to be the, the clear um, you know, favorite right now. But basically, um, a programmer writes this code, and a lot of the code looks like sort of, you know, if 1,000 tokens are sent, you know, are sent here, and these other conditions hold true, then you know, hold 500 tokens, and then send the other 500 over <coughs> here, and then basically, if somebody else comes and you know hits that function and says, you know, I want to unlock those tokens, and we'll check, are you approved? Are you the approved person to pick up this these tokens? Have these conditions been met? So you know you can do a lot of like sort of if this if this then that kind of code. Um, it is stored on the blockchain in bytecode. So the blockchain um, it's a shared database amongst all these different computers. So it becomes quite large, quite fast. Ethereum is probably at like forty-five gigabytes or something right now. I I don't really know, but you can just look it up. It's easy um, and. Basically, these smart contracts are compiled down and that actual code is sitting on that database. And then what ends up happening is that it opens up a new address. So every smart contract that's deployed on the Ethereum blockchain, it gets its own address, just like any other account uh, owned by an individual, which is called an externally owned account. So if I set up a new wallet with MetaMask or Jax, I get an address. And the smart contract being deployed gets an address that's exactly the same. It's just that there's some code related with that address that governs kind of how that address operates. But what's really cool is that the smart contract, just like a wallet, can receive ether. These functions that I was talking to, these if this, then that kind of, you know, fill, fulfill these requirements and then conditions are met kind of functions, they're called by sending transactions, and that requires that you pay a little bit of gas in the form of Ethereum. Gas is nothing, it's no new token or anything like that. It is in fact Ether itself, <laughs> the currency of Ethereum. But it's a very, very small denomination of it, and that's just to prevent people from spamming the network and basically just going, you know, function call, function call, function call. So basically, Every time you ask this world computer, Ethereum, to do some computation 
on a smart contract that's stored on this distributed database, every time you ask it to kind of, you know, do a function call on this database, you will have to pay a bit. So if I want to send Mark some ether, that's a very simple wallet to wallet transaction. Doesn't touch a smart contract. And that's going to cost 21,000 gas. It's just a number that, you know, they just, they just, that's just what it costs. That's gas units. It will be calculate, it will be denominated in whatever Ethereum is. And then if you want to get a US price, you just have to find the price for the day. So that's me sending, you know, externally owned account, a wallet, a, a personal account to Mark, that's Ether transfer, 21,000 gas. If I wanted to send Mark tokens that were managed by a smart contract on Ethereum, I actually have to go talk to the smart contract. So I call a function on the smart contract. I pay a small gas fee. It's more than 21,000 because the smart contract has to check a few things and do a little bit of bookkeeping. And then if everything's cool, it will send the tokens to Mark's address. <laughs> and then Mark, if he wants to go and look up the, his token balances, he can see that he has those tokens. So an ERC-20 token uh, just at the end there, it's just really a smart contract. So an ERC-20 token is just a, it's like a ledger. It's a smart contract that represents a digital ledger for those tokens that's sitting on top of a blockchain that you must use its native currency in order to call the functions to move around those tokens. Makes sense? We're all good, right? You guys are pros, experts? I'm just kidding. Um, but let's walk through, uh, so let's talk about the decentralized applications for a second. So, uh, these dApps, that's what they call them for short. Um, let's walk through like a typical sort of user experience. Um, so just based on this diagram, basically a user is going to open an app that is utilizing this library called web3.js. You can see the Ethereum Foundation is really good at naming things. Smart contracts? Sounds cool. Web3, who wouldn't want to be part of Web3? Um, so a user opens an app that is utilizing Web3.js, right? Now that's the official library from the Ethereum Foundation, but again, I, I know, I am aware, there's other libraries and stuff, guys. So there's other ways to talk to the Ethereum blockchain from a web application or from within an iOS application, from a Java application, from an Android application, all sorts of stuff. I also know that Android is based on Java. Um, so Web3 loads the user account and the smart contracts. So the user actually has to be visiting the website with some sort of wallet integration. So what that typically looks like is you run a Chrome extension if you're running Google Chrome, and that will inject your wallet account into that website so that the Web3 code, the, the JavaScript code, can, can pick up, detect your wallet, no kind of you know know which account you're surfing this this web app with okay and it's also going to load the smart contracts that's part of the protocol that you're interacting with with this app so let's say you've just arrived on crypto kitties marketplace i've never bought a crypto kitty so i'm just going to make this up um so you arrive on crypto kitties market.com and you uh you want to buy one of these cats you see a bunch of cats there so what you're going to do is you're going to click on a cat and you're, it's going to say, do you want to buy it now for blah, 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 ether? And you say, yeah, I want to buy that cat. So you're going to hit that button and basically you're going to be sending a transaction to the blockchain and you're sending it into the CryptoKitties like marketplace smart contract. And then it's going to go fish out that particular CryptoKitty from probably a bunch of other smart contracts checking that you know certain conditions are okay. And then basically what's gonna happen is um, it's gonna come back and it's gonna basically say, once the blockchain does its thing, mining, making sure all the computation's safe, making sure you in fact had that much ether, then it's gonna you know, take that ether from you and send it to whoever was selling that crypto kitty. So that's blockchain validates the update, checks everything's cool. Your, this application, the CryptoKitties Marketplace website, is going to continue to ping the blockchain, or maybe it has like some sort of web saga connection, and it's basically going to check for a confirmation to the blockchain. It's going to say, hey, blockchain, is everything okay, right? Has the kitty actually been transferred to, let's say it was me, has the kitty been transferred to Matt, 
and has the Ethereum been paid out? And is everybody cool? Do we need to, you know, do we need to cancel this? Do we need to revert anything, any changes? No? Okay, cool. So the app checks, then the user sees the result of this tra uh, transaction. So that's the UX layer again, coming back saying, congratulations, you've made a purchase of a kitty. And then everybody parts, because you got your crypto kitty. Um, so that's kind of just like how a typical flow works. So then there's this thing, like people are still wondering, what is gas? Um, so basically, it's uh, these code instructions are measured in gas, right? So not all the instructions are equal. So when you want to store stuff on the blockchain, I mentioned before, this thing is shared on every computer that's mining Ethereum. So it gets big and you don't want to burden it with a bunch of crap. So storage is really expensive on the blockchain. If I just want to loop through an array and check a bunch of stuff and be like, hey, who has all these tokens? And then I just want to go brrr, like that's super cheap. And uh, in fact, reading data from the blockchain is free, right? If I wanted to check a bunch of other stuff and do these loops, then that would cost a little bit. But if I want to store stuff, so let's say I had a smart contract and all it had was a string and it just said message, like string was my message variable. And then I wanted to put a message like an actual string message into the variable message, then I and it said, you know, hey guys, welcome to decontrol. That would cost a lot, like in ter in variably in terms of Ethereum. It would cost a lot more than a simple Ethereum transfer. And it's because I'm burning that string into the Ethereum blockchain forever. Doesn't matter even if somebody comes across and they write over top of it, and I said, welcome to decontrol, and Mark said, thanks for coming to decontrol, now get the hell out of here. Um, if he made a transaction that changed that string, at some point in time, it said this other thing. So the, the blockchain database, it's always building up over time. So at some point it said, welcome to decontrol, and then Mark paid to overwrite the variable, but you can still always go back and look and see all the transactions, right? Because it's a transactional database. So it's still expensive, no matter what you do, no matter which way you slice it. So this gas is measured in what's called GUI, and the gas price is set by the user. So when I went to buy that crypto kitty, I don't have to go back, you guys remember. I, I got my cat. Um, when I went to buy the crypto kitty, and I said, yeah, I wanna purchase this crypto kitty, I get also two other options. I get an option to set how much I'm willing to pay per gas unit, um, poor guy. We get, we get to choose how much we're gonna pay per gas unit, so per unit of comp computation, we get to choose the gas price. If we set a gas price too low, then the miners are gonna ignore our transaction, it's gonna take forever. If we set a gas price that's just right, then we can, you know, we'll get in fairly quickly, with usually within like 30 seconds to 60 seconds. Uh, if we set a gas price that's really high, it's just gonna go shoop, and it's gonna go really fast. So, um, one last thing on that is you can also set the, the maximum gas you're willing to spend in terms of Ethereum, and that is just to give you, the user, an upper bound on like how much you're willing to spend to get a transaction to go through. So sometimes when you're calling a function of a smart contract, you have no idea how much computation that smart contract is going to do. So you're going to want to, you know, kind of limit it as a user, right? So again, you, because of the wallet software that you use to browse a decentralized application, that's your wallet. You're in the driver's seat. You get to choose these things and how you interact with the network. But if all of this sounded really confusing, that's because guess what? We're trading sovereignty for complacency. So, you know, we're trading like complexity and, you know, real management and ownership over our own stuff versus basically having someone else take it, take care of it for me. Like if I want to sign up with, you know, TD Waterhouse or whatever and just start buying tech stocks like all day long and trading them back and forth and back and forth, that's great. But I got to pay $7 a trade. Where did that number come from, right? Well, that's TD Waterhouse's deal, and I'm trading, you know, I have a trade-off there. So, anyways, uh, back to this. Um, this is the rough sort of, you know, napkin kind of calculation is, uh, it, it used to be, by the way, 21 Gwei, this is really old, guys. It's now like 
it's not like one or two or something like that. You can go to ethgasstation.net. You'll figure it out. ETH gas station, and that will tell you what price to set in terms of GUE. And then what you do is you times it by the actual gas units, then you'll get an amount of ether, and then basically it'll spit out to some US dollar amount, right? Or Canadian. Um, just on the, uh, just on this uh, gas unit conversion, what did I want to say on this? Oh yes, what is GUE? That's weird, right? So uh, Wei, W-E-I, is the very lowest denomination in Ethereum. And it's funny, there is actually no concept of an Ether, one Ether or one ETH. It's actually a 10 with 18, or sorry, a one with 18 zeros behind it. So going this way. Um, so that's one ether. It's a one with 18 zeros behind it. A GUE is a one with nine zeros behind it. So it's halfway in the middle. And that's kind of how that the gas prices are given. They basically say, okay, you have to do 21,000. This is a wallet to wallet transfer. You have to do 21,000 <laughs> gas units worth of computation. So times it by one or two GUE, which is a 10 with nine zeros behind it. And that's how much ether you have to pay. Okay, all right, <laughs> it's, we can come back to it guys. I'm almost done. So token contracts, so token contracts are ledgers and I, I spoke about that before. So you've got the main blockchain, which is like accounts and balances of ether and then it's maybe smart contract and balance of ether. And then, oh, there's this whole other smart contract code and it's maintaining this distributed ledger of um, you know, of tokens, right? Where are these tokens? Where did they come from? Well, somebody wanted to fundraise their shitty little ICO. No, I'm just kidding. They wanted to fundraise their open source egalitarian software project, and it's really, really valuable, and it's giving a lot to the open source community, and so they decided to issue a small, very reasonable amount of tokens, and they asked you guys to pony up your hard-earned ether for these tokens. Maybe. Um, but basically it's just a smart contract at the end of the day. And this is just a few snippets of the smart contract. You can just go to like ethereum.org or, or ethereumfoundation.org and find all that stuff. So uh, this is an important, in, um, I'm trying to do an Ethereum uh, standard or specification or ERC or whatever you want to call it myself. There's no real like formal way to do this, but ERC20, so what does that mean? It's Ethereum request for comment. So I'd like the Ethereum community, which is to say anyone that has any Ethereum or you know has a GitHub account, to come and comment on this proposal. And ERC20 was a specification to create a, um, what's called like a standard interface for tokens. So these are smart contracts that can represent accounts and balances of what? Of some arbitrary token. So ERC20 became a standard. Um, CryptoKitties, we talked about it before. Um, so ERC20s are what's called fungible tokens. So that means they're like cash. So uh, what's your name? You're gonna be famous because I've been staring at you all night. Sorry? Livio. Livio? Yes. Okay, that's a cool name. The first Livio I've ever met. <laughs> so Livio gives me $5. Canadian, I give Livio $5 Canadian, that's fungible, right? We're both back at the same value as far as the world is concerned or the perception of Canadian dollars is concerned. So ERC20 defines accounts and balances, fungible tokens. Now, if Livio has a crypto kitty that's super rare, it's got really cute eyes and some big you know, whiskers that curl like Salvador Dali, and I have a plain old scruffy crypto kitty that's not very, worth very much, and we swap these crypto kitties, who's better off, right? So these are, this is what's called non-fungible. So uh, ERC721 is the standard around what's called non-fungible tokens. So that's just kind of something interesting. So you can dive into these, anyone can look at them, guys. Go to GitHub go to basically uh, the Ethereum GitHub page and look for the EIPs. And again, why EIP and not ERC? 
I don't know, but e EIP stands for Ethereum Improvement Proposal. Typically, how I like to rationalize it is that an ERC is a request for comment of something kind of like coming in as a draft, and when it hits EIP status, that means that it's either a, a change that they are going to implement to the core Ethereum protocol, so it might be adding new functionality to Ethereum, so new ways to program smart contracts, um, some fixes to the blockchain. Um, that's Ethereum core pro proposals, but it could also be something like ERC-20 became EIP-20, which is basically to say that the entire Ethereum community has now accepted that this is the standard interface <coughs> that we use for wallets, exchanges, and decentralized applications in so much as they refer to fungible tokens. So anyway, it's a lot, but you can check, you can check it out online. So now, oh, why you all came, right? Everyone wants to make, everyone wants to make some mad money. I'm gonna Jim Cramer this thing, smash the soundboard. So, um, no, but uh, basically you, you should know what you're doing and some people, I don't know who comes to these things, so I forgot to kind of like ask you guys who's who, but uh, basically I, I'll just give a little disclaimer because if you do participate in the ecosystem, like myself, even as a developer, you will be holding on to Ethereum at some point or another and you're going to be spending it to publish your smart contracts and pay for gas fees and buy crypto keys if, you, if that's your thing. So the best practices for new investors, uh, basically don't trust the advice on the internet, do your due diligence. There's a lot of people on YouTube claiming they can make you rich, we all know this. Um, guys, just really, really, really use your brains here. Um, of course you don't want to miss out on something, that's called FOMO, but you also don't want to uh, you know, just listen to shills, which are you know, random people on Reddit, YouTube, uh, even they're, they're getting sophisticated, they're writing blog posts now. It's like they look like, hey, here's me at my coffee shop with, you know, my cup of coffee. And I'm, I'm reviewing these, doing deep analysis on these ICOs. Um, but yeah, people are going to tell you to go all in. They probably got in early. The ETH price is dri driven by speculation and hype. There's a lot of speculation and hype in this, um, in this industry right now in general. But again, like, uh, I hope I made it kind of clear that I'm... I'm Part of this, um, I'm part of this ecosystem and this community for different reasons beyond speculation and hype. Um, and there, there are people like that. So there is a story about all these stories. Did you guys, did anyone indulge and read these like slam posts on uh, consensus in New York? Hands up. Did you see like a, it was a bunch of excess. It was crazy. It was like all these parties and stuff. So um, I was in New York, I didn't have a ticket to consensus, I didn't go, I sat in the lobby on a couple of days and I just met with people, but I had a clear reason why I wanted to be there. There were people in this ecosystem that for some reason or another, they were drawn to New York to participate in various you know, meetings and events and stuff, and it really helped me get you know, get down to building rapport with these people and making some plans in the space for actually building applications and actually doing real things. So um, it's not just speculation. There are people trying to build out the actual infrastructure, the picks, the shovels, the applications that people can enjoy and actually get some real value and utility from. Um, crypto markets, if you are like a markets player trader kind of person, then they're, they're really a lot faster. Uh, than regular markets. Um, Shane's our intro to cryptocurrency guy, so if you want, it's not just a, you know, Shane's not gonna, he's not gonna tell you what to invest in. Are you Shane? No, he's a, Dogecoin. he's a- Dogecoin, I'll tell you Dogecoin, do it now. Yeah, Dogecoin, right now. Um, no, that's just a joke. But, <laughs> so uh, Shane will tell you uh, stuff about wallets, about exchanges, about how to not get screwed, you know, things like that as a, you know, uh, like a utility to the community, free talk, just like I'm doing about Ethereum. But I focus more on um, Ethereum itself and smart contract development. So price risks for Ether, we've got SEC regulations and that is an ongoing conversation. Um, you know, uh, there's also the, the question, you know, what are these tokens? Are they utilities, securities? Well, that debate is still raging on. It's still a gray space. There's not a lot of um, stuff 
you know, not a lot of clarity coming out yet about that. Um, there's Bitcoin downturn. So when Bitcoin basically goes down because a lot of the volume of Ether is traded in Bitcoin, not just straight out to like US dollars or Korean won or whatever. Um, basically, the price of Bitcoin can drag down the price of Ether, which is, which is to say like stop looking at cryptocurrency and dollar values anyway. It's like if the market just goes down, like don't worry, you've still got the same amount of Ether or Bitcoin or whatever. Um, but yeah, sure, you can't like yank it out and get a bunch of money. Um, but anyway, so uh, I don't know. Any way you guys want to look at it, this part's really exhausting for me. Flash crashes, token market takes a hit. What does that even mean? China, China, China. Um, ICO and crypto regulation, right? Um, so this is what I want to talk about now as an investment opportunity. Um, so I kind of shoehorn this in here. Obviously, this is the part that I'm excited about. So there's the next wave. So right now you've got fungible tokens, coins, altcoins, blockchains, uh, all those native currencies and all of the tokens launched on Ethereum. They're all priced under some big cryptocurrency market cap. And you can go look at coinmarketcap.com and get a very clear picture of the space right now. Some would say it's not that clear. Oh, you can't really trust coin market cap. What can you trust? I don't know. Um, but basically, those are all the coins, the tokens, and the cryptocurrencies, the fungible ones, right? The ones that are traded on exchanges. That's sitting at uh, probably, I don't know, it's either 400 billion, 500 billion, I don't care, it's somewhere there, right? So it's a lot of value, perceived value. Who knows if everybody wanted to get you know, their billions out, would it, would it really, would it really you know, crank out 400 billion? I don't know. But then there's this whole other market. So you look at something like CryptoKitties. Uh, it's done about 25 million already or something like that. I can't even remember where I read the figure. But if you really drill into unique non-fungible tokens, so this is like markets for basically digital baseball cards, virtual game assets, and also um, virtual certificates that are tied to like real world goods, right? So there's a lot of luxury brands that are thinking like, hey, why don't I sell, uh, you know, why don't I sell a $5,000 purse and then I'll put a digital certificate on it and then that digital certificate is that person's digital badge into a bunch of value added services. So the person goes to sell the purse and the other person says, hey, give me the digital certificate. Like I want to go to the, you know, the backstage Prada sponsored Drake show or whatever, you know, I don't know guys, I just made that up. Does Prada and Drake have a thing going on? Um, so anyway, there's markets for all of this stuff, rare bits, open sea and more there's virtual and physical bridges. So there's stuff like phone protocol, which is, uh, more of a, it's a fungible token protocol, but it's actually giving you, um, location <coughs> data inside, uh, the Ethereum blockchain. So phone protocol is working out basically how to do kind of like this proof of location stuff. They are going to layer on some sort of non-fungible thing. I haven't gone super deep into it, but it's very interesting, right? So there's a bridge between the blockchain and the physical world. Crypto goods is just a, a thing. Like I met the guy who started it. It's super funny. So basically you have this crypto kitty and like, that's great. It's just this virtual thing. And crypto goods is basically uh, letting you just, you know, if you are the owner of that crypto kitty and only you, you can stamp it onto a coffee mug or a t-shirt or like a, like a pair of underwear or whatever you want to do. It's, it's pretty funny. Um, so bridging cryptocurrency fungibles and non-fungibles, that's interesting. That's kind of like an area that I'm looking into right now. Um, so there's things like token curated registries, bonding curves, curation markets. These are all like token powered, um, basically building blocks of applications and, and sort of ways for decentralized applications and, and token like token communities to come together and to say, you know, I want this and now, well, I want that. And, well, that's a shitty idea. So we're going to vote against you. And, you know, then you get half your tokens taken away if you, if you suggest a bad idea. So there's all sorts of interesting little economies and systems being built around this. So let's just wrap it up. Um, Issues and criticism, so ICOs, uh, obviously, you know, is this a good funding mechanism? Is it not? Is it a utility? Is it a security? What 
the hell is it? Well, you know, laws um, around the world, they're not quite ready for cryptocurrency. They're not quite ready for, um, I don't wanna say blockchain, 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 but they're not quite ready for decentralized networks where people can trade across borders stuff that is digitally scarce, right? So the laws are not set up for this. Digital property traded across borders, what is this stuff? What's making it valuable? These are all open questions. So um, there's a lot of network congestion on Ethereum itself. And that's like when, you know, something like CryptoKitties launched, it clogged up the blockchain. There are people on Reddit posting pictures of like guys holding up PVC pipe and there's like a cat head sticking out of it just to symbolize the whole thing. Um, there's scalability challenges, of course. Um, so what, why is there scalability challenges? Why are blockchains slow? Well, you gotta keep all these computers around the world in sync. Um, and you gotta keep them in sync over basically validating the next block. If you speed it up, there's more of a chance that people could cheat and they could like rush ahead and build a longer blockchain and say to the network, you should accept all my crap, right? And there's sort of a trade-off in decentralized systems and distributed kind of computing this way, where it's sort of, it's, it's, Speed versus security. This is kind of like a slider there. So it's something to go into, guys. Like I'm not, a, like I'm not a pro expert on all of this. Um, there's the the robustness of the language solidity. I mentioned it was the most popular language for pro writing Ethereum smart contracts. The robustness of that language, the security of that language, and the vulnerabilities that can be exploited when people do the the wrong thing. Just you know, casual programmers kind of experimenting, but maybe they're they're causing a lot of um, Ethereum to be locked up or lost. That's been called into question. Um, the monetary policy of Ethereum is not, uh, is not fixed. So what that means is that there's sort of like a, a block reward every time a new block is validated, and there isn't a final answer to what the final amount of Ethereum will be. So that's something that kind of people criticize the project for. There's this thing called the DAO, the DAO hard fork. People heard of the DAO? No. Uh, so DAO stands for Decentralized Autonomous Organization. So shortly kind of after Ethereum launched, a bunch of guys got together and they said, hey, why don't we create this decentralized autonomous organization, man? You know, um, one of those things. And they can invest in a bunch of different projects in the ecosystem and it'll like grow everything, right? And that'll be great. And, and it'll be fair and transparent. Like who's getting funded from what? Oh boy. And then, so everyone, including like Vitalik and a bunch of other people, they dumped in a lot of Ethereum. And it was like 14% of all the Ethereum on the blockchain at the time. Anyway, some hacker found, guess what? I don't think it was Solidity. I think it was the Python version before it. But he found a bug and he managed to get some of this Ethereum. And that was not cool with a lot of the people who had put their Ethereum into this project. So they did what's called a contentious hard fork, and then that's why you have Ethereum Classic and Ethereum. So basically, contentious hard fork would mean that some of the community went, went one way, and they had enough mining power to do it, to keep it going, and the community went the other way. And this was kind of like an emergency fork of the blockchain. So what that looks like is block, block, block. You take a snapshot at this moment in time of all the accounts and balances, you kind of stop things for a little bit and then you kind of just go like block block and then it con continues on like that uh bitcoin cash another uh hard fork don't want anybody to get emotional here but um be careful yeah you never know taylor's gonna pop out of nowhere um <laughs> just kidding Proof of stake versus proof of work, uh, that's another issue, criticism. So what's the future? Um, so there's a lot of hype around zero knowledge proofs. Uh, I'm not gonna do it justice, but basically I have a bunch of data and you want to ask a question about that data and I don't have to show you my data in order for you to get an answer that you can trust. So basically that's kind of like a zero knowledge proof. So I could have like an employee database of, you know, a thousand employees and you're a life insurance provider and you want to say, you know, how many employees are over the age of 
blank, 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 right? And I don't have to show you my data to prove to you that I actually have employees with those records. Fair enough? So look it up, it's cool. Um, so it's gonna unlock a lot of cool potential. They're gonna add that to Ethereum. They've sort of started the first steps to that. Casper is this proof of stake thing that they're moving to. Nice ringtone, I like that. <laughs> um, Casper is the proof of stake that they're moving to. That's like the name, that's like the code name around the protocol. Um, so that's just like how the network's gonna achieve consensus will be people staking their Ethereum and saying, I'm a good actor, I'm gonna validate transactions in an honest way. And then, you know, it's gonna go around and if it comes to their turn to validate the next block and they do some funky business, they can get slashed. So their stake can actually be reduced. And um, you can't just like, there's a whole bunch of mechanisms built into it, guys. Uh, it's not, I'm not gonna be able to cover it, but you can't just like kind of like, you know, stake, do a bunch of funky stuff and, and run away before you get slashed. They figured this all out, um, hopefully. Uh, so sharding, that's another way that basically right now the entire Ethereum network validates everything and they're gonna split the network up into pockets. And so basically like when you run a smart contract function, only one fifth or one tenth of the Ethereum network is gonna validate that. And that's a way to kind of get some scalability as well. So there's other uh, things like Raiden and what's called, so Raiden is basically just a side channel, a state channel, uh, like a payment channel, whatever you wanna call it but it's a way of doing some of the uh, payments and token transfers and stuff off the blockchain and doing it on another network. It's a lot like Lightning Network, if you've heard of that with, with Bitcoin. So you got the main Bitcoin blockchain, then you have this Lightning Network layer, and basically you kind of like, you kind of debit some Bitcoin on it, it becomes Lightning, what do they call it? Lightning Bitcoin chain? Lightning Network, or just, but it's not, but it doesn't have a light. To the actual unit. It's just it's Bitcoin. Bitcoin on the Lightning Network. Yeah. yeah. So you kind of like debit it on this network, and then anyone who's on the network, you go like zoom, 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 zoom. You make a bunch of like fast micro payments, and then when you want to get out and you want to get back onto the main Bitcoin blockchain, you can eject, and it's all done through <coughs> similar kind of uh, blockchain style cryptographic receipts between all of the people. Um, Plasma is this uh, scaling for smart contracts that allow other people to kind of run their own blockchains, but they don't have to like run, um, they don't have to run the actual like final like fraud settlement. It, Plasma's, it's like that, but it's, it's uh, like with a twist, twist of, a twist of Plasma. Um, so where are we going? Uh, again, you know, without like putting on a tinfoil hat, guys, sovereign individuals, thinner governments and thinner hierarchical kind of industry and, and corporate structures, hopefully. Um, token economy and mass adoption in marketplaces, I'd like to see that. I think it's really exciting um, kind of space where people can kind of create, um, exchange and trade value in a peer-to-peer -peer way. I think it's, I think we all deserve the right to do that. That's kind of, you know, what I believe in. Um, just like we deserve the right, even if we have a smartphone in our pocket, to go to a field and, sorry, your name again? Mia. Mia, Mia and Livian can have, we can go to a, a grassy field together, and sorry man, and we can, we can have our smartphones in our pocket and be a part of, we can be connected to the internet, but we can actually have a private conversation. And there's some, you know, there's even some questions about whether or not that's possible today based on, you know, some, some stuff. So again, uh, this is really exciting. Provably fair gaming and applications. What does it mean to be provably fair? It means it's transparent. It's on the blockchain. Everyone can see the transactions. They know they haven't been you know, screwed over by the house, by a bunch of other players at the table communicating and, co and co like corroborating against you. So provably fair gaming and applications, that's really exciting. Um, and decentralizing, Basically, compute time, storage, uh, all sorts of apps, AI, VR, whatever. Like, if we're if we're moving towards a world where AIs are really powerful and stuff, you know, we're gonna want to have them kind of be kept in check. And one way to do that is to kind of just like 
you, you have to pay gas to call smart contract functions on Ethereum, that's a way to reduce spam. You can basically you know, wrap an AI in something that you actually have to pay for to get some value out of it. And it could be a way to kind of you know, keep a handle on that. So here's some resources. I'll let you guys take pictures if you want, but it's all out on the nets. Um, I'll, I'll throw a link to this in the, in the comments. This is on just like a public view, viewable version. But you can take your, take your pics, guys. I'll comment it. Click, click. These are good. Uh, oh yeah, token economy is the, is, mwah, it's great. It's, I highly recommend it. sign up for the newsletter. Also, uh, sorry, it's, it's kind of like a recycled slide from, from you know, a long time ago. And I, I tried to update it a bit today. I forgot about, there's block by block. That's another newsletter. So just like, if you've got notes, write it down. Block by block, token economy. These are ones that I actually subscribe to and read and I like them. Um, yeah. Oh, influencers, don't bother guys. I'll, I'll post the link. Just go to meet up after. But influencers, um, I've met like a lot of them now. Uh, yeah, I even met him. He came by here, Andreas Antonopoulos. We were having a party here, and he came and spoke at some conference down at the convention center. And then I was standing and talking, and I was like explaining blockchain to somebody here at Decontrol. And he just like wheeled around the corner, and I was like, oh, hey. I did like a double take. Um, did anybody watch the, the Netflix documentary, Banking on Bitcoin? Yeah. Yeah? Watch it. Must watch watch it. it, and there's a there's an Ethereum one coming too. That's oh, like that's like sponsored by Netflix. It's like it's like being paid for by them. Like I get it's some production company, but whatever. Um, Fred Wilson, this guy, he said the the greatest thing. They were all in Congress and they were doing this hearing on Bitcoin, and they were like they're like Fred, you can't blow. Well, they weren't addressing him, but they're like you can't expect like blah 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 to, for, for us to just let this go and be this free market, blah, 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 There has to be some regulation, right? And Fred Wilson, he's just, he's awesome. And he just leans forward and he's like in Congress and he just says, I gotta tell you, I think it's a terrible idea. If we learn anything from, uh, if we learn anything from the internet, it's anything that China bans, we shouldn't be investing in it. Yeah. So that was the quote. I didn't really do it justice. Check it out, it's awesome. Um, <laughs> So Juan Benet, IPFS, Filecoin, all these people are great. This guy's writing is rad. It's really hilarious. Daniel Jeffries, he's, uh, he writes these really cool kind of stuff. Bob Summerwell is, uh, Summer Will is local. He's a Vancouver guy. He doesn't work with consensus anymore. He's kind of doing his own thing now. Uh, okay, so let's end off with a little quote. So, Creating provably fair economic systems is near zero cost. I explained how you can create these provably fair smart contract token economies, fungible tokens, non-fungible tokens, all sorts of different structures and cool like little mechanics and, and design around them on the Ethereum blockchain, and it's near zero cost to deploy smart contracts. It's like a couple of bucks, it's crazy. And you can get people motivated behind your project they pile on and they do some development, they deploy some smart contracts to talk to your smart contracts, that you know, you mint some more tokens, blah, blah, blah. And, and I don't mean like ICOs or like shilling your tokens. I mean literally like building applications, building games, building utility, selling utility, you know, and then basically earning Ethereum maybe. So individuals are free to join, create, and exchange value on any network that they wish. So the question is, how will this shape the future of commerce, governance, and society? Government and society. Um, so that's like an open question. It's one to, it's one to grow on. Just kidding. I, you can tell I just like, I just don't like like, uh, I don't, I don't like the stuffiness, guys. I'm trying to try to keep it fun. <laughs> you can connect with me. Uh, also, I mentioned uh, join D Control Band. So basically, uh, there's a Slack sign up at the back, and you can also go there. Shane, can you go to the Slack and request the invite? Not sure. Yeah, we can do it hereafter. Okay, so we can sign you guys up, and basically, again, just to recap on Decontrol, because um, this is a great space to just uh, host meetups and basically uh, be a part of this community. 
every Saturday night, guys, there's an open house um, from like 8-ish till 11 or 12. I've been down here some nights and it's just absolutely awesome. So it's a lot of people, yeah, they're hanging out, they're talking about Bitcoin, Ethereum, and decentralization and build applications that they're building or art that they're making. And you know, a lot of it's going, a lot of the conversation is around uh, Dogecoin right now. Um, so definitely look up Dogecoin, plan to maybe check it out, grab a ticket. It's gonna be the end of uh, a June. If you're just learning about the space, you're learning about like, you know, cool stuff that people can actually do in the space. Dogecoin's a great way to learn about kind of how how memes and culture and art and expression and value are all coming together and they're being expressed, you know, on a blockchain, which is cool. Um, and yeah, that's, I think that's it. Yeah, thanks guys.